Hello, everybody. I am here today with Ray Snedeker, veteran and American hero. First of all, Ray, I want to say thank you for coming and speaking with me today. I'm very excited for this.、Um, could you please give everyone just a brief overview of everything you've been able to accomplish and sort of an overview of everything you've done? Okay, in my adult life, I joined the Air Force at 18.、Mm -hmm. uh, after training, basic training, I went to. I was a Put into security service as a radio intercept operator. I transferred out of it into loadmaster after about five years, and、uh, from then on, I finished my career as a loadmaster in the Air Force. Thirty-one and a half years. Wow, thirty-one years. That's way. There's a lot of things that you've been able to accomplish. We spoke off camera many times, but I would like to kind of just go over everything from the beginning. Just kind of give a whole timeline of everything you've been able to do and like kind of your life as a total. So. Can we start off maybe with your childhood? Like, where were you growing up? How was school for you when you were little? What was your childhood like? Do you have any siblings? What was your childhood like?、Uh, I was born in Grain City, Kentucky, which is more more than a stop in the road. Actually,、okay. um, I went to、uh, move to Hillsboro, Ohio, when I was about two. Lived in Hillsboro till I was about five, and then we moved back to Grain City,、mm -hmm. and then I went went to. All my grade schools. I went to three or four different grade schools. My father was a tenant farmer, so we kind of moved around farm to farm.、Mm -hmm. And、uh, graduated from high school at Mays Lake High School, and that's when I joined joined the Air Force. And、uh, mm -hmm. from then on, I've done amazing, been able to do, and been、yeah. afforded the opportunity to do amazing things in the Air Force. And I've been involved、right. in a lot of、yeah. fantastic projects and things. And some、mm -hmm. I volunteered for, some I got volunteered for. <laughs>、yeah. So when in high school did, was high school when you first decided that you wanted to join the military? Yes,、uh, I was going to join the Marines at, before I graduated from high school, and my mother wouldn't sign the papers, so、oh, I had to wait till I to... graduated. Then、okay. I couldn't get in the Marines, so I went in the Air Force, which was a lucky move on my part.、Okay. Uh, I lived a lot better than they do in the Marines, but、wow. anyway, I I decided then that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to get off the farm. Okay, I was tired of farming. I tell the story all the time. I went to Vietnam on my senior trip just to get out of farming. So wow! So that was kind of the main like motivation and yes, like wanting to、certainly. get out of that. What did your parents do for a living? What, what?、Uh, farmers. My mother、oh, worked. So, okay, my yeah. mother worked in tobacco warehouses when part time, at, in back in those days. And my dad was a tenant farmer. Worked for a dollar a day.、Wow. We lived on a dollar a day. Dollar a day. In、That's、the forties and、wow. World War Two. Wow, were they supportive of your decision to want to join the Marines and、oh, eventually、yes. joining the military? They were very proud of me after they didn't、That's、have、amazing. to sign the papers. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so you get out of high school and you join the military. What was that experience like? Like first starting off, like what were some of the challenges you had to go through?、Uh, what was was it a good first experience? Like what were some things you remember about like first starting off and like your first couple years in the military? Well, the first day I got there, I thought I'd made a mistake. The guys yelling at me.、Uh, the next morning, when I woke up at five o'clock, when they were beating on a trash can, if my mother had、wow. come in that barracks and got me and took me home, I would not have been embarrassed. I wanted out. Oh、then. wow! So that's that was my bad experience to start off. <laughs> Turned out it taught me discipline.、Mm -hmm. You know, there's all kinds of things you learn. The structure. Yeah, and、uh, it was the and, best thing ever、yeah. happened to me. It, yeah, now you're probably happy it, that you stick with and it. I and I loved、yeah. it. I, I was going to be a highway patrolman after four years, and I had to go to. I was in Kansas. I had to go to California to join up, and I had to be out thirty days. And I had a six-month-old baby and wife, and I can't do that. So I re-enlisted、wow. for eight hundred and forty-seven dollars to stay four more years, which was a lot of money then. Wow! And then I became a loadmaster out of that, and the rest is history. I,、mm -hmm. Best job in the military、wow. by far. When did you first start working with the security service? I know you touched on that a little bit.、Uh, 1959. I went to school in late 58, early 59. In April of 1959, I was、mm. sent to Masawa, Japan, as a radio intercept operator. Oh wow! And then after that, that's when you started. Become was it after you became a security service person that you started working and became a loadmaster? Yes. Like, when did that yes. Start? When I rotated back to the states,、uh, mm -hmm. I found out I. Couldn't stay in security service、mm -hmm. and say only overseas can you stay over there.、Okay. So I decided to to go ahead and take my assignment to Kansas, and then at the end of four years, as I was going to be a highway patrolman, that didn't work out.、Mm -hmm. So I wound up re re enlisting and 
became a load master at that time. Oh, wow. And for someone that maybe was watching that didn't necessarily know what the details of being a load master was, what, like, what was that like and what was the job entail of being a load the, master? The load master is responsible for loading all the cargo on the airplanes, okay. uh, directing the loading of it. Mm -hmm. uh, he uh, does the weight and balance, makes sure everything is, the airplane will fly. Mm -hmm. uh, and it'll fly throughout the flight. You have to load it so as, as center of gravity mm -hmm. changes in flight, you have to make sure it can still land. Uh, took care of any passengers we had on board, whether it be Army people or just civilian passengers. Wow. Um, that, that's the extent of his job. And okay. Most of the time, he's unless he has passengers, he is done working once the airplane is loaded until he gets mm -hmm. ready to offload it again. Mm -hmm. So it's a good job. Yeah, that's awesome. So one of the things that I first became familiar with you with and what a lot of people probably know you mainly for was your involvement in Operation Baby Lift. Yes. But you have also told me you were involved in, you said, three total plane crashes? Yes. In uh, 1963, I went to Vietnam for the first time as mm -hmm. a loadmaster. And uh, well, it was the only t first time in Vietnam. And mm -hmm. uh, I was flying C-47s over there. And I'd been there probably four or five months, and I'd been selected to go on a mail run okay. from Benoit down to Saigon, and uh, it was about a 15-minute flight. And we went out, and uh, the flight mech that pre-flighted the airplane missed. There was a satchel charge mm -hmm. in the number one engine, and wow. he missed it. And it was set to go off at, at a certain altitude. So I'm looking out that window when we took off, and we reached about 450, 500 feet in a left bank, mm -hmm. and it blew the engine, the prop, wow. the cowling, and part of the engine off uh -huh. the airplane. Part of it was coming through the airplane. None of it hit me. Uh, we circled back around trying to land. Uh, he was going to land it in a field. As it turned out, he said, I can make the runway. He thought he could. Uh, but the uh, problem was that we'd landed in a field. It was mine, so we'd got blown up. We didn't know that. We and got that around the to the field, and the the fuselage made the runway, but the gear didn't, and that's mm -hmm. when we crashed on the runway, doing wow. 360s down the runway. And that was the first plane crash first you were involved crash. in? Wow. How far into your service was that? How? Uh, that would be five years. That was five years. Wow. That was probably a really difficult experience to go through mm -hmm. after that. So, And then the second one, I'm sure, was that where Operation Baby Lift came in and the situation? No, the was second that? one was another mm -hmm. C-47 in 1965. Oh, okay. Okay. And we were doing a leaflet drop down a, down a river, mm -hmm. and it was about 50 feet off the deck, and we were dropping these leaflets trying to get Vietnamese and Viet Cong to give up. Yeah. And uh, somebody called ahead, apparently, and oh. it sounded like they stuck a machine gun inside the airplane, okay. rat-a-tat-tat. And it was, the bullets were hitting behind me, and I saw them opening holes on the other side of the airplane. Mm -hmm. So we... we Continued to fly as best we could. We found a special forces camp with a what they call perforated steel planking PSP runway, which is nothing more than metal laid down on the ground with holes in it. And the army used it mainly for light airplanes. And so we crashed on that runway, but the airplane was not flyable. And we wow. luckily we found it instead of the jungle. Wow, and that was yeah. my second one. Now, the third one that was in '65. Then the, se third the second one, one was in 1965. Right. Okay. And the third one was not until 1975. That was the C5. So ten Operation years later. The, okay. Wow. So do you want to describe the third one a little bit? I know this, but that's the. Yeah. I. Mm -hmm. This this mission was ordered by President Ford on okay. April, April the third, and he ordered the evacuation of Saigon. Well. This happens so often in the military, everybody gets ahead of their guns and as it filters up the chain of command, it gets mm -hmm. to the big boys on top and they decide they're going to do something mm -hmm. really historic. Yeah. So they decide to floor load a C-5, which I was happened to be on that airplane. Yeah. And we were directed to go into Saigon and pick up people and mm -hmm. we didn't know what we were picking up. Uh, the decision was made. I thought I could put 2,000 babies on the airplane, just floor wow. loading them and put them everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought I could get maybe 1,200 Americans on. Yeah. And if it was Vietnamese, American, and mixed, maybe maybe 14, 1,500. Well, my aircraft commander decided at that point 1,200 is a magic number. Okay. Well, fortunately, they didn't have 1,200 people ready. 
Mm-hmm. We took off with only 310 people on board. Oh, we're wow. trying to get off the ground. Okay. Attacking. Yeah. Um, 14 and a half minutes into the flight, the at 23,800 feet, the had a maintenance malfunction and what we call a bell crank broke and it released three locks on the right, on the right hand side of the airplane on the aft ramp. And anytime more than one lock is unlocked on the aft ramp, mm-hmm. something's going to give if you get enough pressure in the airplane. Yeah. So it went out and if it just went straight out, we'd have been a routine circle back to Saigon, but it held seven locks on the left side, four on the right. So it held momentarily just for a microsecond and allowed the pressure door to slip down, then go back up before it fully released. And it cut the control cables and two of the four hydraulic lines. So we had basically no control of the airplane. Mm-hmm. Pilots were flying it on ailerons and airspeed. That's all they had. Um, so at 23.8, I, <laughs> airplane went into a left spin, left dive to mm-hmm. off, fall off the left. And I happened to be upstairs. I went up to get a water jug and I jumped, my oxygen mask came down and it didn't work because they'd been not been inspected and they'd been sealed together. So I jumped up and grabbed an oxygen bottle and went to the front and the aircraft commander says, get down and survey the damage. And I go downstairs and when I look out the back, it reminded me of spaghetti because there was control cables dangling wow. and real hydraulic <laughs> fluid pumping. And I go down there and everybody's in a panic and I go to the back of the airplane and there's a video, there's a movie out on it, a documentary that shows me walking to the edge of the jagged ramp. That's mm-hmm. Hollywood Liberties. They, I didn't walk that far back on that ramp, but uh, I went back and surveyed the damage. I went back up and reported to the aircraft commander. And then I went back downstairs to help because uh, I knew they need help. We got on the ground and uh, just before we crashed, I was told by another load master, we need to get upstairs, we're getting ready to crash land. So I go upstairs and sit down in the seat and about that time the airplane's coming up, I can hear it screaming. And we were doing 329 miles an hour at that point, still accelerating, wow. trying to get the airplane to fly mm-hmm. again. Mm-hmm. And um, we hit the first time. And um, some of the people took part of the floor out, took some of the people out, uh, lost all 24 main gear, uh, so we only had a nose gear still on the airplane, which didn't mean anything to us at that point. Uh, jumped to Saigon River, landed on the bank on the other side on four Viet Cong soldiers, and uh, the airplane came apart at that time. My life went into slow motion. Uh, everything had slowed down to the point I was just wishing it would hurry up and I'd be done. You know, it'd be over with. I'm still alive. Yeah. And it finally came to an end, and, and then I. I got out of the airplane and surveyed some of the damage and looked at bodies and helped people as I could that were alive and, and then help evacuate 145 babies and 12 adults out of the uh, troop compartment, which mm-hmm. where most of the survivors were, all the survivors other than a cockpit was there. Wow. That's crazy. I couldn't even imagine going through something like that. How did that affect you after like kind of just dealing with everything? It affected me bad for a long time. Uh, I drank way too much and tried to forget. I had uh, uh, survivor's guilt because some of my good friends had gotten killed. One guy was on his last mission, uh, a good friend of mine. And I, I went through a lot with that for two or three years. And my wife hung in there with me and finally got out of it without going to counseling or anything. So I straightened up after that. I knew I had to, I had three kids. and. But anyway, it, it affected me quite a bit. And I think of it every day. Wow. Now, April the 4th just went by, and that's a tough day for me. That's the day of the crash. And mm-hmm. and these kids are calling me that I know. Mm-hmm. You know, we're talking. That were involved in the, in the crash, yeah. yeah. In the crash, yeah. They're, you know, they're 40s yeah. and 50s now. <laughs> How were you able to keep in contact with them after I all met them through reunions. Been... Okay. Uh, and then I met a few of them, and then... I became friends with them on Facebook, and then other people would make connections. Oh, yeah, yeah. So I I know probably 50 of them. Wow. And I keep in close contact with about 20. Okay. Maybe 25. I talk to a couple of them every day. Mm-hmm. How did that affect them growing up? From the conversations that you have with them, was that kind of uh, hard for them to like? Well, they don't know what they don't know their birth date. They don't know how old they are. 
Wow. And they don't know their names. So wow. their names were taken out of a phone book mm -hmm. and written in, into a piece of paper wow. to get them out of the country. Mm -hmm. uh, the birthdays were made up. Doctors came in and said, that one's six months old, that one's 12 months old, that one's three yeah. years old. And so they don't know. they just given a birthday. So that affects them a lot. Some of them have told me that, you know, they're mixed race. Mm -hmm. So growing up back in, in the 70s and 80s, they, they, some of them had a difficult time at school. Mm -hmm. And some of them knew what they were, that, where they'd come out of Vietnam and they were yeah. fathered by Americans. And so that was hectic for them. And the fact they don't know who they are and how old they are, that really bothers them. That's crazy. Them. Yeah, that's... I, Stop I and think about that. Yeah. I can imagine, yeah, not knowing. That's just, yeah, but that's important. So I'm glad that's... I, I think have one. Let me interrupt you on that. No, I you're have fine. one that I talk to every day. Her birthday is August the 1st. Mm -hmm. She celebrates the entire month of August. She doesn't know what her uh, birthday It may not even be August. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that makes sense. Every because, day. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's good. I think that's good that you're able to still keep in contact with them and oh, kind of see it. how they were able to grow it. up. So I think that's I that's really great. As a um, matter of fact, the same girl, I'll, let me put a little side story on it. Of course. The same girl uh, just contacted me at Easter. Mm -hmm. And she and I have flown on a C5 since then. We got a, we got a ride to go to Florida from Texas. And she remembers the exact seat she sat in. She remembers everything that happened. Wow. She can describe it all. And she contacted me at Easter and she said, I want to get back on a C5. I want to sit, I want to sit on an airplane that's not flying, sit in that seat, and I want to fully remember the entire story before I forget it. Wow. So I've, I've already arranged it. We're going we're gonna to go to San Antonio in, in October and we're going to get that set up. Did she say how she was able to remember all of that since it was so like long ago? But well, she, she was herself? five. Oh, she was five years old at and the time. she okay. wasn't supposed to be alive. I mean, I made a decision on who stayed downstairs mm -hmm. and all of those got killed and it was oh. a, based on they could take care of themselves okay i put babies upstairs in the seats so we had medical crew to take care of somehow she was still Carrie, able to get up somehow she got up there somewhere i don't know how <laughs> wow. and i met her in dana point california and she mm -hmm. walks up and said i'm i'm carrie and i'm knock is my name actually and i'm i was on the plane crash with you and i said okay and, you know i had my name tag on and then uh, she said, I was five years old. And I go, time out. No, it's not possible. And then she told me, she says, I wound up up there. And she could describe the things that happened to me. Wow. She remembered a fire up there. And I said, yeah, there was a flash fire. The oxygen lines exploded, caused a flash fire, and sent some hair on people's arms. And the thing about that was everybody denied to her that there had been a fire. And Does she, she was so it? ecstatic that day that I confirmed that she because she, she had remembered remember it. Fire. Yeah. Wow. I know now that you are able to kind of travel around everywhere. You even came to our school and kind of gave us a story about Operation Baby Lift right. and how important it is to you. What makes it so important to you that you keep that story alive and to inform everybody on that? Like, what about it is so important to you that that like keeps that story like this keep the kids. Mm -hmm. I want to do it for the kids. I want to keep that story alive for them. And they do more on it than I do. They, they, a lot of these kids speak all over the country, different things. Mm -hmm. um, so, but I want to keep that alive. And I'm, I'm actually shocked that this is a big deal. On April the 4th of every year, every major news channel will have this story on. About the operation? Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. you know, you think, History happens and it goes away and everybody forgets about it. Mm -hmm. This is still, and I think the kids talking about it, um, mm -hmm. you know, keeping the story alive. They have reunions all over the place. Yeah. Uh, I, but I want this story to never be forgotten. A bit. And I want to describe to them how successful these people are. You know, there was things like Afghanistan that yeah. we stole them out of the country and, you know, we kidnapped them and things like that. And, Mm -hmm. they're they have a much better life than yeah. they would have had that's crazy yeah, yeah. i love it I, I just love the fact that we're keeping that story alive for mm -hmm. them last question touching on kind of operation baby lift i know you kind of touched on it but what were some of the biggest things that you were able to take away and kind of learn from the whole experience of like going through something as like traumatic and as just intense and 
Oh, yeah, just life changing as that was it, for it's you. It's life changing, and I'll be honest with you, the other two crashes happened so quick. Mm -hmm. I didn't have time to get scared until yeah. I got out of the airplane. Uh -huh. This one, I thought I was going to die. I was scared to death. Uh, the main thing, I was never an advocate for training. Okay. And every year we had to do remote, you know, we had to do training every year mm -hmm. and uh, uh, recurrent training. And I would just fuss and complain. And I, I already know this. Why do I have to do it? Mm -hmm. Well, I learned from that. You better know it. There's not time to read a book. Mm -hmm. You just react. And I, after that crash, I always put that in my stories when I'm talking to military. Do your training. Listen to what they're saying. Yep. Because you may have to use that one day, and when it comes time to do that, it's too late to learn the procedures. Yep. You just react. Yeah. And if you know what to do, you do it. And that's that's yeah. my big thing from that, uh, and the joy of saving some people's lives. Yeah. Now, kind of getting kind of sidetracked, because a lot of people may just know you from the operation, but you've been able to accomplish a lot more even past that point, and just like a lot of things you've been able to accomplish. One thing I thought was interesting, you work with the European Space Agency and yes. actually work with that. Do you want to describe that a little bit? Because I found mm -hmm. that really interesting. What was yeah, that I, like? Uh, I got selected on that to, to actually I worked at Wright-Patterson then. I was okay. in the air t transportability tense loading area. Mm -hmm. So what I did was figure out, engineer it out and say, that'll fit in if we take the wheels off, or we take the wings off or whatever. And I just did all that. Well, I worked that project for the European Space Agency for uh, Space Lab when they mm -hmm. put it up in space. Yeah. And uh, I got to go to Germany and work on that. I was in the factory, and, and that was really interesting. Uh, young people that were part of that was just blew my mind. You know, mm -hmm. you think of professors as old, old people that do that kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah. These were young people, and the Space Lab was successful. So, and I got to go to the Cape and stand the, with the news media oh, wow. to watch it launch. That's the only launch I've ever seen. That's amazing. Went off on time, believe it. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. So that's probably a really cool experience. For oh, you I loved it. I loved it. And of course, they were over here working. So I, I keep in touch with some of those engineers still. Wow. Uh, another mission I wanted to kind of touch on a little bit that I've heard you about, the uh, DSRV mission. Would okay. you be able to maybe touch yeah. on that a little bit and like what that was? Yeah, like the DSRV stands for Deep Submergence Rescue Vehicle. And I worked on that for a long time trying to figure out how to fit it in the airplane, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was used, the, I was told it was being used to rescue submarines who have sunk. And it was the idea came up to them when you, you probably don't remember this, but the USS Thrasher went down and it mm -hmm. killed everybody on it. They never could rescue them. So they come up with this uh -huh. idea. I have actually transported it to two or three different places where a submarine had gone down. Mm -hmm. they, they didn't even put it in the water. I mean, it, right. they just figured out it was too late. And I guess it would only go to a certain, uh, certain depth. Now, there's mm -hmm. rumors out there that it was used for other things, but I've done some research on it. And, course the government's denying it but i don't know so i i, I won't even talk about that that's okay that's okay of course um another mission i wanted to touch on that you kind of touched about I, like it was just kind of a crazy story once i heard it for the first time the mission that you did from china to new york and that whole mission that you had to do with that would you want to talk about that or? yeah yeah that's not a problem okay i did that not too long before i got out of the military and mm -hmm. uh, i got selected to go on that mission we were going to go pick up a what we know as a MiG-21. I forget what they called it. I, in fact, I was looking for the picture this morning. and I don't put anything out. I've let everything buried somewhere. And, mm -hmm. But I couldn't find the picture to find out what the actual name was. But it was a MiG-21 in our eyes. But the Russians called it something else. And uh, they had it in China, and they had three of them. Mm -hmm. And we went over there to pick them up. The interesting part of that story is we landed, and there was... Well, they got diverted twice to mm -hmm. land for no reason so we could pay a landing fee. Uh, we landed in Xinyang, which is right on the Manchurian border. And it's cold. It's cold up there. Yeah. And um, they had three of these ready to go. Well, when we landed, I had told, we all, loadmasters and flight engineers carried guns on the airplane, hidden. Mm -hmm. And I had told my guys to put put their guns away, lock them up in a lockbox before we landed. 
We opened the door and we got stormed by the military wow. and essentially got hijacked. And uh, we were sitting there for four hours while they people talking with them. It was not, well, the government may have been involved, but it was the military that took over the airplane and they held us at gunpoint in there. And uh, they finally took the aircraft commander and myself out and we went to a, a secure area, talked to some Chinese. Uh, they made us read a few papers and things, and we went back to the airplane. And they released us. Don't we still to this day don't know why they did that, mm -hmm. and nothing was ever done about it as far as I know. Well, we spent four days there getting these airplanes ready to go, and uh, and flew them from Xinjiang, China, back to Beijing, then to Long Island, New York, for some kind of refurbishment. Mm -hmm. uh, and that always struck me as strange in those days. You know, Russians and Chinese are our enemy. Mm -hmm. Now we're doing repair work for their airplane. Uh, I, I don't know what was behind all that. Yeah. But that was an interesting mission. And you said that was towards the end of your time yeah, at the was, service? Yeah, that was in probably, I can't remember the dates, 88, early 89. And okay. I, I got out the end. And how, how many years were you in the service total? 31 years, four 30. months, and 24 days. Wow. So I, had, I could went to 33, but I decided to get out. What made you decide to get out? What I were was kind traveling of... too much. I was gone my entire uh, okay. life flying. And um, I just had enough. Was it kind of, of kind of wanted to be with your family a little bit? Yeah. Did that kind of continue oh, yeah, they were to growing up without kind of me. Like... And my kids are growing up. My wife had raised them. And I just want, I was just tired of living out of a suitcase. So mm -hmm. I went ahead and retired. Then I went to work for an airline, so I started doing the same thing. But since you did it for so long, like you were there for like 31 years, you said, was it difficult? Was it hard for you to let go and finally leave the service, or was it kind of a peaceful, yeah, like, happy Yeah, it was, moment, right? and, and I thought I would miss it. Mm -hmm. And the only thing I miss is the people I flew with. I don't miss mm -hmm. the flying and living out of a suitcase. But, yeah, I, I've hesitated about leaving, but mm -hmm. I was just tired. And you said after you eventually retired, I don't know what year, but eventually you started volunteering at the Air Force Museum? Yes. When was that and how, what led that to that? That would have been in, uh, April Fool's Day of 1990. <laughs> was the day I went to work. But when I was still working at an airline prior to that, mm -hmm. and working at the museum, I uh, had, uh, uh, airline, airline, airline. I don't know what I was going to say here, guys. He kind of already did know you. I was working at the airline, and I was, oh, I had a friend about the funeral. I had a friend that says, why don't you come and work with me part-time? I said, what do you do? He said, I work at a funeral home. I go, I'll never work at a funeral home. No. I had all these preconceived ideas. So I, I, I didn't go to work for him. And then after I retired from the airline, he kept bugging me and saying, why don't you come work for me at the funeral home? Well, by April, I retired one January. By April, I had decided I've had enough. I've had my coffee in the morning. I've had breakfast. I read the paper. What am I going to do? It's 8 o'clock. So I decided to, to to take that call him out, and I got the job. And it, it was a very fulfilling job. I wish I took it sooner. I, I loved it. You know, I wasn't a funeral director and I couldn't embalm, but I helped them. Uh, it's just a loving, caring place if you're in the right funeral home. And I love that job. That's amazing. Yeah. And I know after this is also what you're still up to now, you were able to get in contact with, if you want to talk about Hal McCoy, you were able to start yeah. working with him and then became a chauffeur. What? How did that start? Um, well, I was working at the museum, uh, volunteering out there, and I was also traveling a lot. I was just traveling around the country. Some of it was for speeches, but some of it just visiting friends. So uh, I uh, decided that when I came home off a trip on a Thursday, and I was on was about 10.30 at night, I went in my uh, working office, and I got on a, a computer, and I started looking at, at some emails and things. And I thought, I'll just go over and check out Facebook. So I went on Facebook, and a friend of mine that worked at Teradata then, he had on there, I found the dream job, but I got to continue working to pad my 401k. And this was in 2013, and, uh, February. And he, uh, he put a link up in the corner, 
So I hit on that link, and it was Hal McCoy. Well, I read all of his articles. I didn't know him, I never met him. And I was reading that, and it gave all the prerequisites, and you know, which wasn't anything. And uh, said, if you want to do this job, just send me an email, mm-hmm. and I'll evaluate it. So I wrote an email. I had about a paragraph and a half. And I thought, this is crazy. Uh, he doesn't know me. I don't know him. He probably has, this was Thursday. He put our ad in the paper on Sunday on Facebook. So I said, he's probably got a thousand applications. So I deleted my email. I went in and got back on the computer and running around through things. And it's about one o'clock in the morning. I thought, I can do that. And I'm tired by now. So I, I went over there. I wrote an email, but I really put four bullet points on it. I just put, I'm retired military aviator, and I can take you to each and every Reds home game. I'm a lifelong Reds fan, and I'm a chauffeur driver. So I'm used to carrying passengers. And since I retired from the military, I'm used to long days. Hope to hear from you. Four points. Mm-hmm. And I thought, he'll never call me. That was on uh, Friday morning, about 1 o'clock in the morning. And on Monday, I got a phone call that I missed. Fortunately, I still have the voicemail today. Oh, wow, the voicemail that he sent you back. And I play that. that. We, we did a thing for MLB. We did it for Fox Sports and did it for mm-hmm. ESPN. And I play, I play that video, wow. I mean, that recording every time. I still have that. Um, when he, he interviewed me, he said he'd like to take me to lunch. This was Monday afternoon about 2 when I saw the message. I didn't call him till like 4 because I didn't know what I was going to say to him. I didn't. Mm-hmm. I, I was dumbfounded. didn't know what to do. So I finally called him. He said, I want to take you to lunch. That's all on the, on the audio. And um, so we go to lunch. I pick him up on Wednesday. He says when he left the house, by the time he sat down in the car, he had already made up his mind. Just mm-hmm. that little bit of talk, he was going to hire me. But he didn't tell me that. We went to lunch and met a bunch of important people in Englewood. Then he takes, I drive him home, and then he says, uh, let me think about it. Let me evaluate this. And he sent me an email about five hours later, said, if the job, you want the job, you got it. Of course, I took it. That's it was amazing. A, oh, it was great. Still doing it today. Yeah, and have you guys have like a pretty good relationship now? Like, have you guys still oh, like that? That's His wife great. That's thinks awesome. we're separated at birth. We finish each other's sentences. Ah, uh, yeah. yeah. We like the same things, basically. That's you know, awesome. He, he, we're real good friends. So kind of as a uh, ending point here, I know like you have been through a lot of experiences. I think there's a lot that you could pass on to the younger generation now. What is some advice and wisdom that you think you could impart and give to someone that maybe was in your shoes, like how you were getting out of high school, wanting to join the military? What advice would you give to them or just anybody based on some of your experiences? Based on my experiences, mm-hmm. I would say you should. everybody should serve in the military at least two years just to learn structure and discipline for if nothing else. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm a believer in that. But I think if you really want that as a career, that's that's the place to go. I've done well by being in the military. And uh, so I would recommend that to anyone. I would recommend the Air Force over any of the other branches because you live in barracks and you're not living in the mud. And, but anyway, each to his own is for that. I thought I wanted to be a Marine. So when you're 18, Sometimes you make foolish decisions. <laughs> uh, but uh, the main thing is, is just love your country, for God's sakes. You know, mm-hmm. in school, learn history. If you don't learn anything else, learn history. And World War II is my favorite era, not Vietnam. I can spend hours and hours and hours in the Air Force Museum just in World War II. Mm-hmm. I think it was the last romantic flying it was ever done. That's when the mm-hmm. re- last real flying was done. Uh, just love it. But I'd recommend everyone go in the military mm-hmm. to learn how to live life. Mm-hmm. And secondly, to make a career because you can do well in the military. Now, there's other jobs you can get in the military that translate to civilian life. Mm-hmm. A loadmaster really doesn't. There's a few of us around, but they, they don't. That's not, that's not a job you want to mm-hmm. get after you get out of the military. Course. I want to say thank you so much for your time. This has been Ray Snedeker, American Hero. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Yep.